Hello, and welcome to our quarterly podcast on financial transactions and transfer pricing. During these podcasts, we have informal discussions with specialists of the POC network on new developments. And today, we go fully corona-proof to the three corners of the world. So I have the pleasure to introduce our three guests. We have Tanya Kese from Germany. We have Erin Venter uh, from New Zealand. And we have Augustin Ayla from Argentina. And I myself am David Odeur, based in Belgium. First, let's go to you, uh, Tanya. I've heard that there is some draft German legislation that intends to implement Chapter 10 into German uh, legislation, but it's, is it actually the case? So is it fully in line uh, with the objective or is it a bit different? Very good question, David. And um, I guess, firstly, I mean, we've had the draft legislation since December 2019. So there have been various updates to the wording, but um, I think sooner or later this may actually be coming. And so it is very important to kind of, you know, get prepared and be aware of what it actually says. I mean, the draft legislation is certainly not consciously against Chapter 10 of the OECD. At least, uh, I suppose that's fair to say that there is a commitment to be consistent with the OECD. But I suppose the German perspective takes um, a bit of a kind of specific viewpoint on some of the aspects of Chapter 10. Um, and one particular aspect, which I think may give some room for discussion, to say the least, is how interest rates will be viewed in Germany going forward. Um, so the purpose of the legislation is, in a nutshell, uh, to set requirements for interest deductions for loans coming into Germany. Um, and one particular criteria is that the interest rate shall reflect the rating of the group or of the parent company. So presumably, if the German uh, borrower is a subsidiary of the group, um, you shall not uh, go to a standalone credit analysis, but look at the group rating as the default position and set interest rates uh, accordingly. Now, the German logic for doing so, because you might think like, wow, how is that consistent with OECD? Well, the logic is that um, the standalone or also implicit support analysis that the OECD uh, sets out uh, is, in the German's uh, viewpoint, relatively complicated. You would only do it for TP purposes. It gives room um, for tax planning in a way. Um, and so in their mind, well, wouldn't it be much easier to simply rely on the group's rating? Um, it takes away a lot of uh, subject uh, parts of the analysis. Um, it gives certainty to taxpayers, and you pretty much have the interest rate straight away. So that's the logic behind the new uh, legislation, or the legislation as it is drafted right now. Um, but I think I should also mention that there is a, a possibility, um, you would call it escape clause, to deviate from that logic if you felt that a different rate better reflects the arm's length principle. Um, the door is still a little bit open to, to other opportunities. Okay, because it sounds a bit tax friendly. So you, you take the group rating if you won't, uh, won't do the hassle of doing the whole analysis, or if you have the uh, analysis, you take the standalone uh, rating. So it's is it more a choice or will be a more an uphill battle to try to convince the German authorities it's not a group rating? Definitely the latter. So um, as I said, the group rating is a default position, and that is very, very clearly stated in the law and in the explanation um, to, the, mm. to the draft law. So proving otherwise is certainly an uphill battle. And what I find disappointing is that so far there is no real clear guidance on when and how you could rely on that escape clause, how you would prove that a different rate is better, how you would link that rate perhaps still to um, the group rating. So, I mean, I'd say, well, maybe there's still a possibility to give an, an OECD-friendly interpretation of the whole thing, because the OECD at least gives some criteria on how to analyze the importance of implicit support uh, in a particular fact pattern. And Germany wants to be OECD consistent, but it's certainly going to be an uphill battle to prove anything but uh, the group's rating, and you need to have very proper documentation in place uh, to build a waterproof case because you are clearly deviating from that standard. Okay, so uh, German authorities say they are in line with OECD, but it seems to be a quite narrow interpretation of OECD in, in my humble opinion. You, you also mentioned that this applies for loans coming into Germany, so it's only for inbound loans that you have this that new legislation, not for outbound loans. Correct. Okay, so that's also so food for thought for you specialist. Uh, is this an infringement of EU law, discrimination, and, and the like? Correct. If you go to New Zealand, uh, there you actually have new rules. They're enacted. Erin, can you give an overview of what this covers? 
Yeah, sure. So I think you know a lot of similar themes to what Tanya was saying about the German uh, tax authorities' perspective on on putting in place these rules. However, as you said, ours are um, in place um, already and have been since two thousand and eighteen. So already taxpayers are having to comply with them. Similar to Germany, they only apply for inbound related party debt, so not outbound. Um, and so what they're called is the new restricted transfer pricing rule for inbound related party debt. Originally, these rules were put in place as part of the original, I guess, BEPS action plan. And their thinking was that this was very aligned or a modification of the interest limitation um, action plan of OECD. However, what it became pretty clear is that this is a restriction on actual transfer pricing and the arm's length principle. And so therefore, after a lot of um, consultation with uh, various parties, the government did concede that these are actually transfer pricing rules because they go to the heart of how to price inbound related party debt. So essentially what these rules do, which is this very simple explanation, although they are very complicated rules, is to restrict the deductible interest for any inbound related party debt in excess of $10 million um, based on a credit rating approach, but also around the terms and conditions of the loan. So from a credit rating perspective, essentially you're limited to the higher of one or two notches below the group credit rating or a standalone uh, credit rating of the borrower. So unlike what it sounds like they're thinking of in Germany, it's not really an option to reduce your compliance costs by applying the group credit rating. You not only have to have a group credit rating, and often you know, not every group does, so you somehow have to credit score the group if they don't have one. You have to credit score the New Zealand borrower as well, determine which one's higher, and then um, apply that credit rating to price that debt. That is a pretty simplistic way to describe and how you go through these rules because they're very, very complicated. You also, therefore, are restricted to pricing the debt um, on the basis of ensuring there are no exotic terms. So essentially, it has to be priced as senior, unsubordinated, plain vanilla debt up to a maximum of five years. So regardless of what the genuinely commercial terms of that arrangement are, in order to get a tax deduction in New Zealand, you can only price it if it aligns with those terms. Once you manage to get through all of that complication, you then go and find appropriate market interest rate to benchmark. Overall, there are some very, very limited exceptions, and there's also lots of complicated calculations to work out if you can apply those as exceptions. But what we've seen in our experience is that generally none of those exceptions apply, and so in most cases, um, for inbound related party debt, you're required to follow all of that um, process in order to determine the deductibility. Similar to Germany, the, the thinking is the same behind why the government put this in place. Um, you know, their view around their strong concerns around the application of a standalone credit rating and how to determine implicit support and its value um, versus obviously um, the group's position. So a lot of thinking behind trying to think about those circumstances where there are those really big aggressive financing structures, apply some rules which probably apply to that very small group of people, but ultimately it can have adverse effects for other taxpayers. So it appears to me that uh, in New Zealand to say it should or can be arm's length as long as you follow all these very strict rules. I like the example of the five years. So in other words, even if you could demonstrate that business side would make sense to have a longer loan, arm's length terms and conditions would be a longer loan. No, it's limited to five years. That's the that's rule. You cannot deviate from that. Correct. Okay, great. If you go to uh, Argentina, there are also some new rules enacted uh, impacting into company financing. Agustin, can you uh, explain a bit what uh, has been decided in Argentina? Hi, David. Yes, a lot of new regulation and surprises here in Argentina. Um, first of all, there was an important tax reform in Argentina in 2017 in terms of financial transactions. Uh, we can mention that this reform replaced the former two-to-one debt-to-equity thin capitalization rule with a more BEPS-aligned rule. 
Um, in this regard, the action on, on interest and foreign exchange loses with local and foreign related parties is now limited to 30% of the taxpayers' uh, taxable income before interest, foreign exchange loses, and depreciations. This limitation does not apply to those interests that are subject to withholding, including cases in which a double tax action treaty applies. If the taxpayer can demonstrate that the interest EBITDA ratio is lower than the ratio of the economic group to which it belongs. An additional point is that the taxpayer is entitled to carry forward excess of non-deductible interest for five years and the non-use deduction capacity for three years. After that, later in 2020, the tax administration issued a general resolution which regulates the new law. Um, this resolution has an important focus in terms of intercompany financial transactions. First of all, it states that a detailed functional analysis is required. Um, in this sense, the taxpayer must demonstrate whether the lender has sufficient economic and financial capacity to provide the funds and for assuming the control for, of the related risks. Moreover, among other aspects, the taxpayer must demonstrate that the borrower has financial capacity for repaying the loan and interest at the time committed. Um, additionally, in the, the travel pricing report must include an, a specific appendix with additional information requested for each of the intercompany financial transactions carried out in the fiscal year under analysis. Um, and finally, and among other aspects, the resolution also provides that if the taxpayer does not uh, provide the requested information in the appendix, the interest rate consistent with the credit rating of the multinational group will be used as a reference for determining the arm's length price of such financial transaction, um, which is generally in favor of the tax authorities. So to sum up, we can say that this new general resolution tends to use a similar language to the chapter 10 of the OECD. However, its considerations are not necessarily consistent in all cases. Okay, so once again, debt capacity and, and credit rating. So, so Augustin, you mentioned there is a, a kind of 30% EBITDA type of rule. You also said that uh, there's uh, a new rules on debt capacity, so the ability to repay the interest and the principal. In terms of those rules, should we respect one of both rules? Or is it a combination? Should you uh, respect both rules simultaneously? Well, uh, in connection with your first question, the first part is related to the deductibility itself of the interest, and the second one with the actual capacity of the Argentine borrower. Even though th these are different issues, we consider that the taxpayers should evaluate both of them jointly. However, we do not have any practical experience with the tax authorities regarding this. And in connection with your second question, um, at the moment uh, the company receives the loan, it should be able to show positive cash flow that allow it to pay the loan in the term proposed. It could be cash flow generated by the business or capital contributions or, and or proving that the company will be subject to receive new debt in the future. Um, at the end of the day, it is a matter of proof and facts that the company should be able to perform ex ante. Yeah. Okay. That's quite harsh and, and maybe even conflicting with open market practices. Okay. If I go back to you, and you were talking about maybe the limitations, debt capacity and the like, and, and I know the BEPS action for uh, rule the 30% uh, EBITDA uh, limitation, it's basically a copy-paste of old legislation in Germany that they have for many years, even, even decades. Uh, so knowing that you have that rule for so long, uh, does the new uh, draft guidance also comment on debt capacity more from an arm's length perspective? Absolutely. Um, so the new draft law has essentially three criteria for interest deduction. So um, I already mentioned the criteria when it comes to the level of interest rate with the, the, the rating considerations. I guess the second one that I don't want to kind of, you know, disregard altogether is that you need to demonstrate that the loan is commercially necessary and used for business purposes. So in other words, uh, you can't just simply borrow expensively for a loan coming into Germany 
uh, when you don't need the funds and just put it on a bank account that doesn't earn any interest. So that is the second requirement. And the third, to answer your question, is effectively some form of debt capacity test. Because another requirement is that you need to demonstrate at the point in time that the loan is granted that there is an expectation that you would be able to service the loan. So in other words, that you will be able to make your uh, scheduled payments of interest and repayment of principal out of the cash flow that you're predicting for the term of the loan. So it's going very much into the direction that the OCD is going into around you know, delineation, what is an arm's length structure, um, arm's length amount of debt. The German consideration is that if those requirements are not met, if you can't demonstrate that, then a loan is really an equity contribution instead. And then you're not even discussing what is an arm's length interest rate because you may be facing a denial of interest deductions as a matter of principle. That is, um, I guess, the rule in its um, you know, simplicity, but there are obviously some practical challenges on how to actually make that point, how to demonstrate that interest and repayment of principal can be made. Uh, you already raised the question on whether the repayment shall be made uh, throughout the term of the loan or whether you can assume uh, a repayment at the end. I think those are open questions from a German perspective as well. I suppose uh, my interpretation would be, again, that it should be arm's length conditions. So some people have asked, um, I don't think it is as simple to simply say, uh, we'll just uh, capitalize interest in the end and we'll make bullet repayment and then we don't have to worry. Uh, if those are not conditions that would be agreed on between third parties for similar purposes. Okay, that's fairly similar compared to Argentina. Uh, now, if uh, the term is not yeah, commercial rational or, or a debt capacity, so how you say uh, a loan can be uh, requalified into equity, is it an all or nothing discussion, or could you demonstrate as a taxpayer, uh, maybe not the entire amount of debt should be considered that, but at least the parts. So, so is it an all or nothing discussion, or could you argue it's more a proportionate rule? Well, thanks, David. This is a very, very good question. And unfortunately, as for many questions, um, there is no very clear black or white answer to that. And the reason for that is that the previous draft of the legislation um, very clearly said or very clearly stated that it should be in a proportional assessment. But that wording has changed in the latest draft um, that we've discussed earlier. And there has been no additional explanation whether that means that all of a sudden this is turning into a all or nothing decision or whether the loan should be um, requalified on a proportionate basis. So there is some risk that on just purely reading the wording of the draft law, if it is passed as it stands today, that it could be an all or nothing decision. But I think that there is also some positive considerations, meaning that the legislation should not be um, interpreted contrary to the OECD guidelines, where I don't see that such a black or white decision um, is envisaged. Um, and as I said, the previous draft of the legislation did envisage a proportionate assessment, so perhaps it was merely some, some form of oversight that that wording has been changed kind of in unintentionally. So I'm sorry that this is perhaps a bit of a long-winded answer to your question, and um, hopefully we'll have a little bit more clarity by the time that uh, legislation is passed. Okay. And also note your message that is still draft legislation. There are quite some questions on the interpretation and the exact scope of these uh, rules. Erin, that capacity seems a bit the flavor of the day. Um, what about New Zealand? So did you enact new rules on this one? No, so we don't have any sort of specific debt capacity rules within our transfer pricing rules. So that was one thing that they didn't add to the restricted transfer pricing rule. However, we don't have obviously thin capital interest limitation rules, which are an asset test, so debt to asset of uh, 60%. However, there's a couple of, of things, I guess, that they've done in the restricted transfer pricing rule or in the general transfer pricing rules to also try to make sure that there is not excess levels of related party debt. So one thing is when I talked about the credit rating approach, um, it was a very, as I said, a very simplistic way to describe the rules because actually you have to undertake a test which is called the BEPS risk test. And if you can show that the arrangement isn't high BEPS risk, then you can actually go and do a standalone credit rating of the New Zealand borrower. And one of the key uh, measures of that is if your thin cap ratio is actually under 40%. So while the allowable 
um, level for FinCAP purposes in New Zealand is 60 percent, you could go and do a standalone credit rating if you've got your FinCAP ratio of 40 percent. So that's one way they've potentially tried to limit it. The other way as well, or another thing, is they have fully endorsed the 2017 version of the OECD guidelines. Um, so in our legislation now, we have the fact is you have to follow the analysis in the guidelines, specifically around the accurate delineation of the transaction. And in addition, in the rules, you have to um, go through and prove that all of the terms and conditions of the arrangement are arm's length. So essentially, what they've done is to say, Yes, start with if it's inbound related party debt, prove that you're compliant with the RTP, then go back to general transfer pricing principles and prove to us that it's a commercially rational arrangement and that it would occur in third party circumstances and then go and price that. So I think that's another way to make sure that there is genuine financing arrangements and there is, I guess, substance in particular on the lender side in relation to these uh, inbound related party debt transactions. Okay, so there's BEPS uh, risk uh, test. It seems a bit like the Australian test that they implemented like two years ago where they bucket financial transactions in certain categories and then depending on which category, it's considered as a transaction with a high transfer pricing risk or with a low transfer pricing risk with different consequences in terms of efforts that you should do. Correct, and, and actually, interestingly, when they were drafting the legislation, the policy team was like, well, we have really followed what Australia have done with their guidance, but obviously they took it one significant step further and actually put it in the legislation. And so following, they liked what the ATO had done with their risk assessment, but they took it that step further. And now it's like, obviously, part of our core transfer pricing legislation. So instead of soft rules, it's hard guidance. Yeah. Correct. Maybe a follow-up question. What else do you observe in uh, in field audits? On what are your New Zealand tax authorities focusing on? Yeah, so for quite a few years before the restricted transfer pricing rule came in, inbound related party debt was a significant focus area for inland revenue. So there was a lot of review activity and audit activity um, of those transactions of multinationals in New Zealand. They've then put this rule in what we have seen in practice is that there has been a, quite a significant requirement for um, impacted businesses to restructure their arrangements in order to make sure that the actual interest that they pay aligns with the tax deductible amount. One main thing, because there's a mismatch between the withholding tax position and the income tax position. So that has played out. We're only now just coming through and we're about to see a lot of the first tax returns related under the new rules. And so I think it's going to be a really interesting time now to see how much inland revenue is going to come and review what taxpayers have done. In order to find those particular taxpayers or transactions, they've actually introduced a new disclosure form called the BEPS disclosure, which requires taxpayers when they're filing their tax return to actually tick and confirm that they have thought about the restricted transfer pricing legislation and that all of their interest is fully deductible and in line with those. So we anticipate there's going to be quite a lot of activity once these tax returns have been filed following up. Um, so it'll be interesting to see where that gets to for our clients. Mm -hmm. Okay. Agustin, in, in Argentina, well, what is their uh, major source of uh, tax controversy today? So, David, well, in my opinion, the major source of controversy that companies must uh, have in mind is that after the important devaluations that Argentina has faced in the last years, and the tax authorities will try to recharacterize the nature of the transactions, stating that the financial loan that the local company may have received from a foreign related party is actually an equity contribution, as they have done in the past. Um, therefore, the tax authorities may want to challenge the deductions not only of interest, but of foreign exchange losses that were very huge in the last years because of the devaluation of the Argentine peso. In this regard, what we have observed in connection to the decisions made by the justice in the past is contradictory, sometimes concluding in favor of the taxpayer and in, in other cases concluding in favor of the tax authorities. Um, in summary, what we recommend to our clients is to prepare a solid defense file 
in order to be prepared in case they face a TP audit in the future in terms of their financial transactions. So in practice, I think most of the inbound uh, funding into Argentina is in uh, USD or foreign currency, not in uh, Argentine peso. But Argentine tax authorities are saying, arms length, you should have funded yourself in Argentine pesos. That's basically what they are saying. In, in Latin, based on my experience, I also see uh, an important interaction between uh, TP uh, legislation on the one hand and another type of uh, regulations, uh, typically foreign currency restrictions and, and all the related compliance around that. Uh, how is it today in Argentina? So, um, well, David, in 2019, the central bank started to regulate um, once again the foreign exchange operations in Argentina. Uh, in general terms, the companies need to ask for authorization to the central bank in order to access to the so-called single and free official exchange market. Um, since the companies are not obtaining such authorization, we can observe that the, the Argentine entities are not able to pay such loans and are forced to renegotiate such loans with their foreign related parties. Okay. Thank you uh, to the three of you. Now, based on the discussion and the preparation of the discussion, I thought initially we would have three different regions with three different topics, but basically it's the same topics that uh, come back in, in each of the three countries. So that was surprising to me. At first, step capacity seems to be a, a very important item, which, to be honest, is not uh, very surprising, given the emphasis in Chapter 10. I also hear the discussion on, on the credit rating and the group rating and, and the like, which I think are quite creative interpretation of chapter 10, or at least quite restrictive interpretation. So it seems a bit that we might have uh, 50 different readings of the OECD uh, guidance. So that will be interesting to see how that evolves, especially uh, the three countries we're talking uh, here about are part of the OECD or part of the inclusive framework. So they were around the table when agreeing on, on these texts. What should tax directors do based on what we have just discussed? On, on the debt capacity, I think it's a generally accepted best practice to do some uh, debt capacity testing in respect of the country. But more and more countries seem to have country-specific interpretations. So you should do some checks whether there's some specific interpretations or application in those countries. On the credit rating issue, I would say it's more like a dilemma because you might more and more have a different interpretation of how the tax authorities in the lender's country look at it compared to the borrower's country look at it. To be honest, I don't have a good answer. It's, it will be a balancing act, I'm afraid. So with this, I want to uh, thank the three speakers. Thanks for your participation. Uh, I also want to thank you for uh, listening in. And I want to invite you to our next podcast that will be issued by the end of this spring. Thank you. This podcast is brought to you by PwC, all rights reserved. PwC refers to the U.S. member firm or one of its subsidiaries or affiliates and may sometimes refer to the PwC network. Each member firm is a separate legal entity. Please see www.pwc.com structure for further details. This podcast is for general information purposes only and should not be used as a substitute for consultation with professional advisors.